The music you'll hear on this podcast is from the Impulse Records release, Monk Palo Alto. Now available on CD, vinyl, and all streaming platforms. On Sunday, October 27, 1968, 17-year-old Danny Shear woke up knowing this was not going to be a typical day for him at Palo Alto High School. It's a miracle he slept the night before. He skipped breakfast and headed down University Avenue to the other side of the tracks, East Palo Alto. He put up posters for the Monk Show that night despite the police telling him not to. That's where our story begins. Great show to watch, sir. Guys and gals, so good. Get over there once again through Sunday at the Jazz Workshop. We're two after San Francisco. And We're going down to Texas, Dallas, and Houston. Oh, it's Texas, the land of culture and uh, gentlemen. There. Uh, <laughs> this is KJAZ, KJAZ, Alameda and FM at 93, Stereo Jazz for all of Northern California. My name is Danny Schur, and my day job is when I had one, I was a concert promoter for Bill Graham Presents. I was born in Palo Alto and grew up in Palo Alto, went to all public schools in Palo Alto and started playing drums when I was in fifth grade. When I was in high school, I would go to concerts and usually I would buy a ticket unless I could find a way to sneak in. (laughs) I would go to clubs that allowed minors and I got to know the local concert promoters who at that time, you know, were other students or older people, but they're all old to me. And I, I would put up posters for their concerts and Once I was old enough to drive, I would be a driver for them. And I remember thinking, man, this is great. This is really what I want to do. So I hitchhiked down to the Monterey Jazz Festival that same year because I wasn't old enough to drive. And because I was putting up posters for people, I I think I got, they gave me a ticket to get into the festival. I didn't have a place to stay. And I remember hitchhiking back home late one night, another night kind of just camping out on the beach. You know, I I didn't really know my way around, didn't have anything. But what I do remember vividly is that mostly outside, after the shows, people had their RVs and they had barbecues going on and they're playing music and it was predominantly black. And at least my perception it was, it was predominantly black, coming from a predominantly white community. And I'm checking out the music, and people started saying, hey, man, who are you here to see? I said, well, you know, I'm a drummer. I, you know, I love Buddy Rich, and you know, I'll, I'll take Art Blakey and Elvin Jones. He said, hey, those guys are cool, man, but you, you, know, you got you to gotta check, uh, you know, je- check out John Coltrane. I said, man, I tried listening to John Coltrane. I just, I just couldn't get it. It just seemed so out. And they said, kid, just back up. You got to go back to the beginning. Yeah, he sounds out now, but... He wasn't always, and when you learn about his history, you'll see he's not, even now. I never thought, oh, they're black, I'm white, but it was really the first truly interracial experience I ever had. And that really also changed my life in terms of, man, we can all get along, you know? Then I had heard that Monk was coming to San Francisco. Actually, Darlene Chan, she was a student at Cal in Berkeley, putting on the the UC Jazz Festival, and she worked for the Monterey Jazz Festival. So she said, I said, I wanna I wanna do Monk. So she gave me Monk's phone number, his manager's phone number, a guy named Jules Columbia. So I called him up. I said, I'd I'd like to book Monk at my high school. And he said, Well, this is how much you're gonna have to pay. And I said, Oh, I can do that. I am Professor Robin D.G. Kelly. I teach history and black studies at UCLA. I am the author of the book, Thelonious Monk, The Life and Times of an American Original. I write about music, politics, social movements, and culture. Danny Scher was the president of the International Club, and um, he was trying to raise money for the Peace Corps and for school construction projects in Kenya and Peru. And so he would organize jazz concerts to do that. And and Monk, of course, was someone who he dreamed of bringing to Palo Alto High School. He was kind of impressed with this teenager 
who is arranging a gig for him just across the bay. And I think that he was curious and decided to take it. Thelonious Monk was at the top of his game in terms of the circulation of his music. He was getting a lot of gigs, but he wasn't making much money. And he was open to taking the gig at Palo Alto High School for a couple of reasons. One, it was an extra $500, you know, and he actually needed the money. Nineteen sixty-eight was a pivotal year. You know, you have Martin Luther King assassinated, Robert Kennedy assassinated. There's a lot of tension, but there was definitely demonstrations going on. And we were told, Palo Altans, you know, we were told by pretty much everyone, hey, stay out of East Palo Alto. You'll get, you know, it's dangerous. So I'm putting up posters in East Palo Alto. East Palo Alto at that time, the Highway 101 divided East Palo Alto from Palo Alto. But there was a section on the west side of the highway that was East Palo Alto, and the police are coming to me and saying, hey kid, you better, you better get out of here. It's really, you know, it's not safe. So that's the backdrop. So at the time, black leaders waged a campaign to incorporate East Palo Alto as a town, but also to create independent institutions, cultural institutions, economic institutions that were designed to empower black residents. So you have to imagine, we have young Danny Cher going around East Palo Alto, hanging posters up. The police would make a left, I'd make a right, and I'd just continue putting up posters. (laughs) I'm T.S. Monk, and uh, I'm a jazz drummer, producer, composer, musician, educator, and I'm the keeper of the gate when it comes to Thelonious Monk's estate because I'm Thelonious Monk's son. I was fully aware of what was going on in, in the country, you know, and I, you know, I remember being at school and crying all day when John Kennedy got assassinated. And then I remember being at school and crying all day when Richard Nixon got elected. <laughs> You know, so, uh, but I had a good time. I had a good time. Thelonious Monk was seen as a hero among certain segments or many segments of the black community. When you listen to Danny talk about him writing Thelonious a letter and never expecting to get an answer, you know, but Thelonious responded and he actually showed up and people who didn't expect him to show up were waiting in the high school playground parking lot to see if Monk was going to show up, and he did show up. It's an amazing story. And I know that my father responded to that gig because the gig didn't pay any money. So, you know, he responded to that gig because it was a 15-year-old kid. I know he did. And he loved kids. He sends me the contracts, and with the contracts came uh, exactly what you would expect. And I was being treated appropriately. But... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but the show's not selling. <laughs> and tickets were $2. But if you were a student, the ticket, it was 50 cents less. So the word's getting out. People are seeing me putting up these posters. They say, hey, kid, what's this? Oh, Monk's coming to Palo Alto. No way. No way Thelonious Monk is coming to your Lily White High School. I said, well, then show up at the parking lot. Don't buy a ticket. And when you see him, you'll believe it. And then just turn around and buy a ticket. Danny's response was, look, show up on that day. If he shows up, you see him, buy some tickets and come. And that was the context for that great performance. This was unique. Oh, man, my father was always a lot of fun, man, because first of all, he kept me practically on his leg from the time I was a little boy. You know, he wrote a a very storied composition uh, and named it after me. I got a chance to meet You know, whether it's Miles or Dizzy or Max Roach or Art Blakey or Horace Silver or Sonny Rollins or Charlie Falk or John Coltrane, you you name them. I wasn't that interested in becoming a musician, and he never put any pressure on me to be that. And he would never consciously allow anyone else to put that pressure on me uh, to be that. Although everyone would say to me, wow, do you know who your father is? Right. And I'm saying, oh, yeah, daddy.
I had no idea what was going on in Monk's personal life at all. I wasn't following that. I didn't know anything about it. And he was going through some pretty difficult emotional times at the time but that I was unaware of. So a few days before the concert, I called Monk. He's playing at the jazz workshop. I wasn't old enough to go in there. He had to be 21. And I called him a little before his set just to kind of touch base. Hey, Mr. Monk, we're really looking forward to seeing you at my high school on Sunday. He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, we have a, a, a con, we have a deal. What do you, I don't know. I said, yeah. I talked to Mr. Columbia. We made a contract. He sent me the contract. He sent me your promotional pictures and your bios and the albums. And we're selling great. I, I lied a little there. You know, we're doing great. He said, well, how am I going to get there? I said, well, my brother's old enough to drive, so he can come get you and bring you back. The truth is, I was old enough to come back, but my parents wouldn't let me drive to San Francisco. (laughs) I mean, this is a guy who had been on the cover of Time magazine. He was internationally famous. Had he ignored this 15-year-old kid, nobody would have thought bad of him because he ignored this 15-year-old kid trying to promote a concert. But he didn't. And that's a wonderful thing. I just wasn't sure when he was going to show up. We actually didn't start the concert till he got there. Because I do remember thinking, what if he doesn't show up? And uh, when the show wasn't selling, I never really advertised, you want to go to something that, that's hard to get a ticket to. I didn't tell anyone that I was nervous because they could have pulled the plug on it any time they wanted, very nicely. So Monk comes, he's hungry. He said, is there anything to eat? I said, well, what would you like? He said, what do you have? And I so I sent my mother, my parents were there. My mother took orders for their food, went across the street to a restaurant, brought back food, and uh, everything was fine. I vaguely remember, I don't remember if him or someone else, I said, you can't smoke inside, you have to go outside to smoke, you know, that, that was, yeah, we all got along. You know, you take care of business, You have a little dressing room. You have an area for them to be comfortable. A couple days before the concert, a janitor approaches me, whose name I don't remember. He said, hey, Danny, if I tune the piano, can I record the concert? Now, I didn't know really the piano should be tuned, and I didn't know I wasn't supposed to record the concert. But I said yes to both. Oh, yeah, well, the janitor was the engineer. (laughs) Which is, it's so ridiculous. And it was recorded in a high school auditorium. This is an African-American janitor who struck a deal with Danny. He said, look, I really want to record this just for posterity's sake. So this is the tail end of a great working band. And they came to play. You know, if you listen to songs like Well, You Needn't, which is a tune that Monk composed in the 40s, but had been playing for a very long time, the rhythm section really sets a flame beneath Charlie Rouse and Monk's accompaniment. It's not full of cliches. Well, being a drummer, I'm I'm inclined to to show preference to drum solos, but the drum solos, particularly in Well You Needn't, really spoke to me because every time I think, oh, he played a chorus, now it's the bass's turn, or the, you know, Charlie Rouse's turn. And he kept going on and on, and the solo kept building, and the energy kept building as any good drum solo would. But boy, when the band comes in and the, and the bass, it just, it just took it to a whole, uh, uh, inspirationally to me and energy-wise to a whole other level, which is why I like that song. I, I didn't realize really how small it was when I think about this. And I didn't realize how big the stage was. I thought the stage was much smaller than it actually is. It's actually a pretty good sized stage. He plays his old standards, an unaccompanied rendition of Don't Blame Me, you know, which he'd been playing uh, regularly since 1963, the old stride piano style. Uh, He plays this and the audience goes crazy.
And that is, you know, a song like Round Midnight or Ruby My Dear or Reflections, these were songs that were ballads, but not ballads. You know, they had a kind of, you know, a certain kind of tempo to them, but a certain kind of rhythmic drive that makes you bob your head, even when listening to Ruby My Dear. Or when he ends on this beautiful uh, encore, where he does a basically a, a minute-long version of Sweetheart of All My Dreams, a song from 1928, uh, made famous by Rudy Valley. It was one of the most unforgettable historical experiences in the history of Palo Alto, period. I mean, this is one of the greatest composers and musicians of the 20th century playing in a high school auditorium on a slightly out of tune piano, sitting on a squeaky piano bench and transforming that auditorium into Carnegie Hall. That's my takeaway with Thelonious is that he was true to who he was no matter what. And that's a goal of every jazz musician. How can I be myself? And if everybody doesn't like me, should I change myself? And Thelonious said, no. I'm Thelonious Monk. It is what it is. So the concert's over. The janitor gives me the tape. And I put it in a box for over 30 years. Didn't really think about it, quite frankly. I mean, I, I always thought it was kind of cute. 30 years later, I took the tape down to Fantasy Studios here in Berkeley. And I figured, you know, just for the hell of it, I better have this digitized because I don't know how long a, a quarter-inch reel-to-reel tape will last. And Fantasy Records put their top engineers on it because who knew? I, maybe this could only be played once. I, I wasn't really sure. So I got a CD of it. So 10 years later... Uh, or more than 10 years later, I was doing another fun project at my house, a fundraising concert with the Heath brothers, Percy, Jimmy, and Tootie Heath. And in the process, I became friends with Jimmy Heath. I mentioned the concert to Jimmy, and he says, does T.S. Monk know about it? I said, I have no idea. He said, well, here's T.S.'s phone number. Why don't you give him a call? He actually went through his attic or his basement or garage or something and found this recording and knew how important it was from a historical standpoint. And even though I didn't get it at first, he was persistent. This is a great guy. And so uh, when this date popped up, I called my partner, DXT, and got him involved. You know, DXT is the guy. DXT is now in both the rock and roll and the hip hop halls of fame. And he's the guy that did the scratching on Herbie Hancock's Rocket. So he was a, a substantial artist in his own right. I'm Grand Mix of DXT. I originated in the hip hop community, one of the uh, pioneers, so-called pioneers of the hip hop community. I am noted as the first turntablist on planet Earth via Rocket. I'm a musician, I'm a drummer. I got my first big break with Herbie Hancock. And this guy is off the hook. He does what you call forensic restoration. Uh, it's very, very different. He dives into it the way a whale dives down in the ocean. I mean, he goes deep, deep. He goes so much deeper than anyone I've ever seen. You know, he's taught me so much about restoring these kinds of recordings. And, you know, there are going to be all these anomalies on these old recordings. You know, you got hiss, you got pops, you got background noise and all this. I got that from, you know, looking at how the detectives look at crime scenes. You know, they're looking at a crime scene and they're listening. They're looking at what is out of place. I'm looking for things that are anomalies that are non-musical. And I'm trying to figure out how to work with them. And I just came up with this crazy idea that I refer to as forensic editing, where I started listening not just to the melodies and what was happening in the melodies, but what was non-musical that I can either tune or 
detune or, or hide it by massing it into what was already there because I couldn't remove it. It's much more vibrant, the DXC version, much more vibrant. I couldn't hear it, but there was a... Cre- Have you heard it? Could you hear the... Was there a squeaking in the piano bench? Could you hear that? Okay, then they, they took it out. That was one of the problems because the piano bench squeaked when, when he, was, <laughs> he was going. I know they, there was an issue of... Do we keep it in or take it out? Because keeping it in added something to the, you know, the high schoolness of it. You know, that tape was recorded by a janitor with whatever technology they were using at that point, and basically I joined the band. You know, and that's what became my approach. I figured, okay, let me learn the songs. Let me hear what he's doing, because I'm starting to hear non-musical anomalies. You know, the bass pedal on the bass drum squeaking and certain things. Monk was a big guy who moved around on a squeaky bench. And so we had these these issues that we had to deal with. It's a pseudo stereo recording now, and it just sounds absolutely marvelous. And and most importantly, he has a real understanding of Thelonious as a player and the sound of Thelonious, because something that most people don't understand about Thelonious Monk is that he was a sound guy. Well, I have to admit, I listened to the concert really in its entirety, just because Tia sent me the final version. It really gave me chills because, you know, while we've heard all the songs before, the arrangements were so spontaneous. He wasn't doing his normal set. And everything is a little faster. I just think it has more colors than usual. And this is why I say I know that Thelonious was feeling very, very good. And it makes sense because, remember, he was already working at a club. So... You know, if you know anything about jazz musicians, if you're a musician yourself, you know when you're working, you're in your groove. You know what I'm saying? I mean, my father was a piece of work. At this point in my life, I'm his son. He kind of stands alone. It's it's, it's, it's absolutely amazing, but people just don't get it until you're gone. But on that day, that crowd, they got it. And the greatest thing is at the very, very end, when the crowd stops and he looks at the crowd and he says, uh, uh, we got to make a gig, <laughs> you know? And that was so typical of Thelonious. We have to hurry back and get to work. We did. Yeah, I, you know what? I mean, people, 50 years later, I think they're giving me more credit than it's due, in a way, you know? I mean, but I'm taking it. I'm taking it. I mean, what, what I really like about it is the relevance. It says something wonderful about Thelonious. It says something wonderful about... Danny Shear, and it says something wonderful about humanity, you know, and how connected we all really, really are at the end of the day, even though we like to think we're not. The music you've heard on this podcast is from the Impulse Records release Monk Palo Alto, now available on CD, vinyl, and all streaming platforms. Monk Goes to School is produced for Impulse Records by Pacult. Copyright 2020, Rhythm and Ning Entertainment, Inc. Under exclusive license to Verve Label Group, a division of UMG Recordings, Inc. All rights reserved.